we are welcoming back Ray Morton, the great movie historian and script consultant who has been so gracious with his time in previous episodes. Uh, we're welcome, welcoming you back for, I think, a fifth time, maybe. I, I'm losing track here. but uh, Something like that, yeah. <laughs> yes. But anyway, uh, he... He has written several books, A Hard Day's Night, music on, in the, part of the Music on Film series, uh, The Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Making of Steven Spielberg's Classic Film, which is a terrific book about the making of Close Encounters, A Quick Guide to Screenwriting, and A Quick, go- quick Guide to Directing. And he has also authored the book, uh, a, a recent book about uh, John Gillerman. He contributed an essay about the film we're going to talk about tonight, uh, this is for the John Gilliman, the man, the myth, and the movies, uh, and he was the director of the film yeah. we're getting ready to talk about. And you also wrote a book uh, about this film as well. Well, part of it anyway. It's uh, King Kong: A History of a Movie Icon, which is basically a top to bottom history of all of the King Kong films. And you did such a terrific job. I, I consider that to be the Bible on the King Kong films. So it is a oh, thank just a, you. Uh, Wonderful, wonderful book, and uh, we'll get right down to it. Basically, this is the 45th anniversary of the 1976 Dino De Laurentiis production of King Kong, which was a pivotal film for me in my youth, and I think it was a pivotal film for you as well. And this Absolutely. Is, yes, this is a, an interesting time to be commemorating it because we just got the announcement uh, about two or three weeks ago that the – Blu-ray, the North American Blu-ray, for the first time is going to be issued by uh, Scream Factory. Well, it was Shout Factory, but I'm, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm confused because they had the Scream Factory label and then it was Shout Factory yeah. only. But, but anyway, it's Shout yeah, I or think Scream it's Factory. Shout Factory, Scream Factory yes. is their subsidiary, I guess. <laughs> yes. yes. So. I think mm-hmm. after COVID, they kind of phased out the Scream Factory label for a little while. I, I could be wrong about that. But anyway, mm-hmm. Shout, Scream are going to be issuing King Kong in a collector's edition, a two-disc collector's edition nonetheless, with Mm -hmm. reversible artwork, and this is just the thing that we always had hoped would happen, and you are contributing the audio commentary. I I can let that slide now. I kind of had a hint. You posted some cryptic messages on Facebook, and I had an idea, but uh, uh, now we can officially confirm, and I am so excited about that. That is just going to be uh, fantastic. And so since you are so knowledgeable about this subject, we're going to let you run with it and tell us a little bit about the 1976 King Kong, what led to the decision to uh, make the film and the production and the troubles therein and the the uh, post-production and all of the other things, even the NBC television version. We'll even talk about that. There we go. <laughs> which will be on the disc, by the way. It yes. will be on the Blu-ray. We are super excited yeah. about yeah, that which as is well. Very exciting, yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> well, the, the the irony of King Kong 76, since we're talking about John Gillerman, the director, mm-hmm. is Gillerman's film prior to King Kong was The Towering Inferno. And the irony is it was Gillerman's movie, The Towering Inferno, that led to Gillerman's movie of King Kong. Because what happened was uh, Towering Inferno came out at Christmas of 1974. And, you know, people remember the um, disaster movies of the 70s. And the interesting thing is when we say the disaster movies of the 70s, what we really mean is one movie from 1972, which is the Poseidon Adventure, and all the other disaster movies, Airport 75 and Towering Inferno and Earthquake, all came out in 74. So 74 was basically the year of the disaster movie. And Towering Inferno was the big, big, big hit of Christmas 1974. So in early 1975, um, Dino De Laurentiis, who had begun his career in Italy, and he's, he's a really important figure in the post-war history of Italian cinema, along with Carlo Ponte, uh, De Laurentiis and Ponte actually, they pretty much are the guys who revived Italian cinema after, after the war. Um, you know, Dino produced, he produced like low budget programmers and then eventually started producing art films. He produced a lot of the early Fellini. Um, and then he pioneered sort of the international blockbuster movie where you basically hire a couple of American actors for a lot of money and then make the film on location in, in his case in Italy. Um, you know, things like Ulysses and War and Peace. 
and then you'd release it all over the world and, and hopefully you'd have this big blockbuster. So De Laurentiis was a big uh, pioneer in Italian cinema. In the early 70s, he came to America. He moved his operations and his life here. Um, and he was based out of New York. And his first three films out of the gate were um, Three Days of the Condor, Serpico, and Death Wish. So he made a huge splash because all three of those were really big hits. And two of them are really great movies. And one of them is certainly a very controversial um, yeah, I'm not sure we can say it's a good movie, but it's a controversial and landmark film. Um, so anyway, he, most of those films were released through Paramount. So he's doing a lot of his work through Paramount. So he and Barry Diller got together, uh, like so around January of 1975 to talk about what are they going to do next? And they were both really impressed with the, the grosses of Towering Inferno. Um, and they thought, well, let's do a disaster movie because well, why don't we jump on this bandwagon? except that they kind of went through all the disasters and between earthquakes and airplanes in trouble and buildings on fire and ships that turned over, there weren't really many other like sort of natural choices for disaster. So they started thinking the, the thought was that the appeal of the disaster movie was you could use big budget special effects to create all sorts of on-screen mayhem and audiences were really eating it up because you know, in the late 60s and early 70s, a great time for filmmaking. But most of the films were sort of of a very, um, what, whatever, realistic and human scale. And those are wonderful movies. But audiences also tend to crave big spectacle. And there hadn't really been a big spectacle genre since uh, the roadshow musicals had kind of gone down in the late 60s and early 70s. So the disaster movie was kind of part of that. Like, wow, big screen magic and and all of that. Um, so they thought, well, what else will create sort of the on-screen destruction that we can use, uh, you know, state-of-the-art special effects to create? So they thought about, well, let's do a monster movie. Let's do a giant monster movie. And, and at the time, they didn't really have a thought as to what giant monster it would be. And there are several, um, several uh, stories as to how they decided to do Kong, finally. The story that De Laurentiis tells or told was that on his daughter's bedroom wall, she had a poster of the 1933 King Kong, and that that's what gave him the idea. Um, Michael Eisner, who was Barry Diller, the head of Paramount's assistant, and later, of course, ran Paramount and then went on to run Disney, he said that it was his idea because he had seen Bette Midler do a King Kong act in her stage show, and he thought King Kong would be a cool subject. And then John Landis, the director, has told a story. At, at the time, John Landis was a writer, and he was looking for jobs, and he had been called in by De Laurentiis to, to pitch to see if he could be the guy to write this giant monster movie. And he was the one who mentioned to De Laurentiis, you know, if you're going to do a giant monster movie, why don't you do the granddaddy of all giant monster movies, King Kong? So I don't know which one of those three is true. My guess is probably in bits and pieces, they're all a little bit true. But anyway, at a certain point, Dino decided that uh, he wanted to do King Kong, and Barry Diller was behind that idea. Um, so that's kind of how the the, um, the idea got generated. Yeah, that's that's an interesting. Uh, so and see, I didn't know about all of the the different people who I, I knew the Dino De Laurentiis story about it, the uh, the poster on his yeah. daughter's wall, and and uh, but the uh, the John Landis story that's a new one for me. Um, I wasn't familiar with yeah, that one, yeah. but, um, you know, Landis does tell good stories, so you never know. A what. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly does. <laughs> yeah, he's good at that, and, and you never know which ones are, are real and which ones are <laughs> a little slightly <laughs> embellished maybe, but, but he's good mm -hmm. at what he does. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so what we'll talk about next here is that there mm -hmm. was another King Kong film uh, being ramped up for production at Universal which was uh, obviously a competing studio, The Legend of King Kong, which had been penned by Bo Goldman. And this created a, a bit of a problem for Dino De Laurentiis and Paramount. Uh, so I'll get you to talk a little bit about that. Right. Well, what happened was, so, so while Dino and Barry Diller were, they were doing their thinking, across town at Universal, Lou Wasserman and Sid Scheinberg, who were running the company, they were pretty much thinking along the same lines. They wanted, you know, disaster movies were a big deal. 
They had Jaws about to come out. This, again, we're talking January of 75. So Jaws was in post-production. But by then, there was pretty much the feeling that the film would do well. I, obviously, no one thought it would do as well as it did. But, you know, they were feeling high on that. So their idea was, well, we have one giant monster movie. Let's do another one. And, of course, Universal at that time was also pioneering their sense around system. Uh, which was the, the system where you put um, a certain configuration of speakers in the theater so that seats would rumble and vibrate and shake, like, for for example, an earthquake, which is the movie that it debuted with, and movies like Midway and Roller Coaster. So they wanted to find another movie that would be suitable for sense around. So with all of those ideas cooking around, they came up with the idea to do a remake of Kong as well, and this is where it gets a little complicated, but I'll try to make it pretty simple. Basically, the original King Kong was produced by RKO. And RKO, by the early, late 60s and early 70s, was no longer an active production company. Um, it had been bought by a company called um, General Tire, so it had become known as RKO General. And they mostly they owned a bunch of television stations, which is uh, where the old Million Dollar Movie Show, which is where King Kong played all the time, um, that played on, but they were no longer actively making movies. However, they wanted to generate money from their old properties. So they had a, um, uh, a guy in New York and I can, I can say his name, but I think I won't say his name just to spare him the embarrassment. But basically there was a guy who was a representative for RKO and it was his job. If people wanted to remake RKO movies or, you know, do merchandising or whatever, you had to talk to this guy. And um, so basically, when Universal got the idea, they went to talk to that guy. And at the same time, De Laurentiis went to talk to that guy. He was talking to them both separately. Um, initially, they weren't aware that each other w uh, were talking to him. But when the deal started to come together, he did tell them there is another bidder. But they didn't, he didn't reveal the name. And um, basically, Universal made an offer. And it was basically $200,000 for the rights to remake Kong with a percentage of the net. Um, and then Dio Rennes offered $200,000 and a percentage of the gross. And if anybody understands Hollywood accounting, you want gross, you don't want net, because <laughs> net you will never see. <laughs> okay. So, um, and, and so basically RKO went with Dino's offer. It was all completely on the up and up. Where the problem came in is that apparently this gentleman who was RKO's representative was very friendly with the people at Universal who were going to make their version. And he had kind of indicated to them that he favored their offer and he was going to recommend their offer to the higher ups to accept. So Universal thought they were going to get it. And then Dino offered a better offer. And as it turns out, Dino was a friend of the head of, our, of General Tire, so in addition to his better offer, his friendship with the head of General Tire made that guy decide Dino was the guy they were going to go with. So they awarded Dino the rights, and he started to get ready for his production. And he did that by hiring the screenwriter Lorenzo Semple Jr., who had created the Batman TV series and had also written the screenplay or co-wrote the screenplay for The Parallax View and uh, Three Days of the Condor. So Dino was really comfortable with him and he started to work on the project and our uh, Universal found out that they didn't get the rights and they were furious. So they basically filed a lawsuit that said that the guy telling them that they he was going to recommend their offer, that was a verbal contract. So they went into this big, um, they went into this big lawsuit suing RKO and suing Dino because he was whatever, you know, part of it. Meanwhile, both productions were going forward. So Dino had his script written by Lorenzo Semple. Uh, Universal had their script written by Bo Goldman, who, you know, wonderful, wonderful screenwriter. And it's a terrific script, actually. It, but it is a remake of the 30. It's a set in the 1930s in much the same way that the Peter Jackson film was, whereas De Laurentiis and Semple felt that they wanted to do a contemporary version. So that was really sort of the major difference. Um, Universal hired Joe Sargent to direct. Joe Sargent was a terrific television director who also made a wonderful feature film called The Taking of Pelham 123. So he was a, he was a excellent choice. And the casting rumors were that they were going to get Peter Falk, 
to play the Carl Denham role, and Susie Blakely was going to be Anne Darrow. Um, that's kind of as far as they got. They did shoot some some special effects tests, including a couple of man in the in the suit uh, uh, tests, in which the man in the suit was told to move in a jerky manner that resembled stop motion animation, which I always thought was a really funny story. Um, so that went along, but meanwhile, it was really they were just fighting this lawsuit, and and what Dino understood was that it didn't really matter who t- Dino felt he was in the right. He had the signed contract with RKO, but he also knew that whichever company got their movie going first was going to be the winner because once the films got underway, it was unlikely they were going to get it to stop. So he became determined to get his film into production first. And this is where it all gets a little crazy. So he was planning to start shooting in April of 1976 Remember, they had started work on on this in early 1975. And normally for a big effects picture like this, you need a long time to prepare. So the the goal was they were going to shoot in April 76. When Universal found out, they announced that they were going to start shooting like January 31st, 1976. So Dino realized he was going to have to start earlier if he was going to beat Universal. Um, So he moved his start date up to January 15th, 1976. Now, why this was a problem is they weren't ready. Um, They basically, they didn't have a King Kong. They didn't even quite know how they were going to put Kong on screen. Um, So what they did is they found all the stuff that they could film that didn't involve Kong or special effects. They reworked their production schedule so that they could start in January um, and it cost them a bunch of million dollars to do that because it always costs more to hurry. But they actually started shooting the film on January 15th, 1976. And about a week later, Universal settled with, um, with RKO and they made some deal with Dino where he could keep making his movie, but he ended up making a deal where he would give them like 11% of his gross, which he didn't love, but that was the way he could get rid of the lawsuit. Um, so Universal ended up making money off Dino's Kong. They put their film on suspension. At the time, they said that they were going to make it, they were going to wait 18 months. That was the agreement. And then they would make their version. Well, they didn't make one in 18 months, but it was that agreement that allowed them to make the Peter Jackson version 29 years later. That's a very interesting tra- trajectory. Yeah. For, for, yeah. <laughs> for very sure. Hollywood. Yes. Very Hollywood. I have yeah. I have a copy of the Legend of King Kong script. I, I have never gotten around to reading it and, and now hearing you talk about it I need to make that a priority. Uh I, I should yeah. I should have done it's, that. It, it, it's a very good script and there's one funny thing in that you would call it King Kong um uh the legend of King Kong. So this is another, so they were calling there as the legend of King Kong. So Dino said, okay, I'll show you. So he called his film King Kong, the legend reborn. And it, it, he had that title on it right up to the first day of shooting. And then they took the legend reborn off it, but he was going to do everything he can to tweak universal. Um, and the other thing he did to tweak universal is he put into production a film called Orca, which was about a killer whale. And if everybody knows that Orca was the name of the boat in Jaws, that was Dino thumbing his nose at Universal. (laughs) (laughs) Totally makes sense. And then later on, after King Kong was released, they, uh, there was actually, uh, but we can get to that later. He actually came up with a plot yeah. for a uh, or an idea for King Kong versus Orca or something of that nature. But we can, yes, yes, he did. Uh, among among other things. Yes, yes he but, did. We, but we can get to. We're yeah. getting ahead of ourselves. So anyway, so we'll get into the production of it. I I know that it was very problematic, and uh, eventually the budget mm. escalated to I believe the number is twenty four million, unless I uh, have my information yes. wrong. Yeah, and that was a lot for nineteen seventy six dollars. Let's. I think the average, it, it was the most expensive American film made till that date. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it, it was no movie had cost more than that at that time. Yes, yes. I think the average production uh, cost for a film was probably I don't know three to five million or something like that. Probably. I'm, I'm yeah, uh, the average film in those days was about three million. Yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, so anyway, that that kind of gives uh, our listeners some idea of, of what an mm. exorbitantly priced uh, proposition yeah. this turned out to be. <laughs> so, well, De, De Laurentiis, the original budget was twelve million dollars, and then they realized um, that with effects that would probably cost more. Um, and Dino actually financed it. He got the rights from uh, Paramount bought the rights to the U.S. and Canada for um, for six million and Dino raised six more million from other sources. And then when they had to beat Universal, it went to 15. And then there's a whole other thing which we can talk about, which caused them to have to rush everything. So it went from 15 to eventually 23 and then finally 24. Yes. Yes, uh, it, uh, it 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 definitely got out of control. We we, we will say that. So yeah. I, I think they started uh, shooting in Hawaii. I believe is where they be, the the earliest um, footage was shot there. I believe. Actually, the 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 first footage was shot in San Pedro, California, which is the port of of Los Angeles. Right. So um, the movie was shot roughly in sequence. So the open, the actually the opening shot of the film is actually the first shot they made for the movie. Oh. It, um, it's the ship getting ready to sail on the dock uh, from supposedly Surabaya, Indonesia, but it was filmed in San Pedro. So they spent a couple of nights shooting the departure of the ship, um, and then they went to sea. There's um, the channel between Los Angeles and Catalina Island. They spent a week shooting out there, and that's where. Um, and we'll talk about Jessica, but that's where Jessica Lang filmed her first scenes for the film. Uh, and then they filmed everything pretty much up till the arrival of the island. That was all till um, the first couple of weeks in January. Then they shut down and regrouped in Hawaii in February. And then they shot all of the exterior Hawaiian stuff over the next three weeks uh, in February of 1976. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I stand corrected. I, I don't know why I had that... Mm. Uh, in my mind, that they uh, shot in Hawaii, uh, that that was how they started the production. But uh, you know, I, I know they had to be. Uh, I think I remember uh, reading that they had to be helicoptered in to the location because it wasn't something that they could get to. Uh, yeah. Well, they shot. Um, they shot in a couple. First of all, they shot on the island of Kauai, which is called, known as the Garden Island. Mm-hmm. And it's the northernmost island in the chain, other than that there's some private island there that's more northerly. But it's the northernmost accessible island. And it is the most remote island. Um, it, it's the one that is the least populated and is the least uh, built up and everything. And, um, and it was actually discovered the cinematographer of the film was Richard Klein. And uh, Richard was very famous for movies like Camelot and The Boston Strangler body heat many other movies richard was a an avid surfer he really loved surfing and he had surfed off the nepali coast of Kauai. and if you've ever seen the nepali coast it's beautiful it's volcanic it's prehistoric it, it's positively ancient and exotic i was lucky enough to go there a few years ago one of the most beautiful places you'll ever see the original idea is they wanted to film on catalina island off the coast of los angeles which is a perfectly nice place but it's not very picturesque. And Richard suggested um, the Nepali coast of Kauai. The problem is there are, there are no roads that go to the Nepali coast. There are a number of valleys um, and canyons and uh, volcanic craters. But in order to get there, they had to basically fly into each of these spots with a helicopter. And, of course, Hawaii is, is a tropical island, which means that the weather was uh, very unpredictable. And they were shooting in February, which is one of the more rainy months. So literally, they would fly in in the morning. And if they were lucky, they'd get a couple shots before the weather turned bad. And, of course, then they had to fly everyone out because uh, helicopters couldn't fly at night. So they they couldn't get too many shots done each day. um, But they they were able to, to get it going after about three weeks. They got what they needed. The most exotic location was a beach called Hanapu Beach. And it's known, the nickname is Cathedral Beach. And anyone who's seen the film knows the most distinctive feature of it is this giant arch that has been worn into, into the rocks, the mountains, basically, that border the beach over many, many millions of years of erosion from the ocean. And it's just a stunning location, but totally inaccessible except by helicopter. 
And the famous story is that um, the first morning they flew in, there was this couple honeymooning on the beach because the groom's brother was a helicopter pilot and they wanted absolute privacy for their honeymoon. So he dropped them off on this beach and he was going to come back like in a week and pick them up. And the morning after he dropped them off, all of a sudden this movie crew shows up like an invading, <laughs> an invading army. And that was the end of their honeymoon privacy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's a great story. Um, well, I, I think I just I, I jumped ahead a little bit. I missed the part about the casting of uh, Jessica Lange. I guess I, I, we should touch yeah. base on that uh, because I know Meryl Streep was originally considered, and uh, there have been uh, it's been reported. Don't know how true it is that uh, Dino told her that she wasn't attractive <laughs> enough for the part. I don't know how true that is. It may just be an urban. Well, uh, according to Meryl, who told the story, Dino actually mentioned to a an associate in the room that she wasn't attractive enough for the part in Italian, not realizing that Meryl spoke Italian. So apparently she responded in Italian, I'm sorry you feel that way, and she left. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, well, yeah, it was an interesting experience because obviously they had written the part, this is the part that, you know, was originally played by Fay Ray in the first film. And Dino had hoped to create a star with the part. That's what he really wanted to do. But, you know, not, not always easy to do. So they, um, the original idea, because again, you have to remember the time of, um, the time was the, the mid seventies. So Barbara Streisand was the biggest star in the world at that time. They, they originally approached Barbara Streisand and apparently she was interested, but uh, she was busy. She was actually filming her remake of the star is born. So that that was never going to happen. They approached Valerie Perrine at one point, and um, I know Britt Eklund auditioned for the part, but I don't I don't know that that went much further than just an initial audition. Um, but Dino had wanted he was hoping to you know maybe find an unknown when one of these these better names didn't work out. Um, so they tested a lot of sort of up and coming folks. I know. Pretty sure Ann Archer, um, at the time, not so well known. I think she auditioned for it. And, um, I think Lindsay Wagner auditioned for it, though I guess she wasn't really an unknown at the time. Um, and, and then that wasn't really working out. So what they, they started to make a deal with Deborah Raffin. And basically Deborah Raffin was going to, um, play the part. And then what happened is, and it's a little murky as to exactly how this came up. But somehow, um, I believe it was the Wilhelmina Modeling Agency in New York, uh, sent out three models that, that wanted to be actors. Um, and there's some story is that, uh, they just, I guess there was a book of modeling photos and someone looked in, in that. There's another story that Charles Bluthorn, who ran Paramount, um, Gulf and Western, the company that owned Paramount, uh, he knew the modeling agency had. I'm not really sure. But somehow these three models from the modeling agency were sent out to screen test. And one of those models was Jessica Lange. And at the time she had done some mime and acting training, but she had never um, formally acted and she had done some modeling. And as the story goes, basically the director, John Gillerman, was very busy elsewhere. So the second unit director of King Kong was a gentleman named William Cronick. And, and, uh, Gilliman said, I want you to test these three models. And Kronick tested the first two and he didn't feel there was much potential there. But when he met Jessica and he kind of did some rehearsals with her, um, he was struck by how beautiful she was, but he also thought she had a really interesting quality to her. And he knew that he said that if, if I just shot her screen test, and put it in with a bunch of other screen tests. He goes, I'm not sure that the special qualities he felt she had would have registered as strongly. So he called Gillerman to the stage and Gillerman came down and he said, I want you to watch me film the screen test. And Gillerman was really impressed. And the screen test was um, three different scenes. So after the first scene, Gillerman really thought she had something. So he called De Laurentiis. And De Laurentiis came down and they both watched the filming of the screen test. And they basically said, if she looks, if she looks good on film, we're going to go with her. And so the next day they screened the screen tests 
And of course, she came across wonderfully on film. And as the story goes, John Gillerman got so excited that he started kicking the theater seat in front of him. And he kicked it so hard that he broke the seat in front of him. And then he turned to everybody and said, I have found my Fay Ray. And that's how Jessica got the part. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's. I had heard uh, Ralph Winters, the editor of the film, had had said uh, at one point that uh, that I think this was he was unhappy with dailies, and he also uh, picked up a, yes. ripped out one of the seats as well. So I think he had a habit of doing that sort of thing. When he either got angry or happy, he he could do <laughs> either way. <laughs> John was John was an interesting guy. He um, he was uh, as we shall say mercurial. Yes. Uh, some people, you know, would have said he had a pretty big temper problem. His, his widow, Mary, who, who edited the book on him that's just out, um, she said that John's explanation was, although he was raised in England, John was French. Um, and she said, he always said, I am a very passionate Frenchman and this is my passion coming out. My feeling is based on everybody I've talked to is it's a little of both. I think he's a very passionate Frenchman. And I also think he had a bit of a temper. Um, the Ralph Winter story is that John took a glass. He was having a drink while they were watching. And he hurled it at the screen and put a hole in it because uh, he didn't like something that he saw yes. there. So, That's what yeah. it was. Yes, I knew that. I knew there was a yes. story that Ralph Winters had recanted. Uh, and I think I read it in his autobiography. And that, that's yeah, great. it's in his autobiography. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that. Yeah, the, and and the funny thing is, uh, they I've heard people say that he would apologize profusely after he would have an outburst, which was kind of funny. He would yes. he would typically go back and oh, I'm so sorry. I yeah. <laughs> well, he he got to the point where um, on on the beach in Hawaii, he started screaming at the associate producer, and the problem is the associate producer was Dino's son, Federico. Right. And I guess Dino called him and basically said, if you don't stop screaming at people, I'm going to get a different director. And after that, they said John, you know, was uh, a little calmer after that. And we should really talk about how John got the job. The original, so Dino hired Lorenzo Semple to write the screenplay. And what they had decided to do was they wanted it to be a modern update. So they set it in modern times. And, and to my mind, Semple came up with a really brilliant idea, which is the original film, The People Who Traveled to the Island, are a uh, documentary film team. And and because it was the 70s and the energy crisis, uh, Semple changed it to an oil company looking for, uh, you know, a rich oil reserve. And I really think they worked out sort of the fake movie science of it really well. And I think it was a really terrific idea. So that was sort of the basis upon which they they built it. Um, and, and if you've seen the film, you know that Jessica Lang plays an actress who, um, she's on her way to Hong Kong to appear in some kind of exploitation film. And she's on the yacht with some sleazy producer who's, uh, showing porno movies or something and the yacht blows up. And anyway, she ends up in a raft and the oil team rescues her, uh, as they're on their way to Kong's Island. And the way that came about is in Semple's original draft. He just had a documentary film crew along to film the oil company expedition. So that was his, his nod to the original movie. And the camera person was a beautiful girl. He, he said he based it on Candace Bergen, who, in addition to being, um, you know, a, a, a major actress, was also very well known in those days for her photography. But they, they all sort of felt that that was a little bit too TV movie-ish, maybe. Um, so what they did is, is Dino wanted, they wanted a bridge from the reality of the oil company expedition to the fantasy of Kong. And Semple got this idea. He said, well, what's a more agreeable fantasy than finding the most beautiful girl in the world, um, adrift in a raft in the middle of the South Pacific? So that's where he came up with that idea. Dino hated it. Gillerman loved it. And then when they put it in the script, Dino finally decided that he loved it too. Um, so that's where that idea came from. But the original person they approached to direct the movie was Roman Polanski, who was really hot at the moment off of, um, off of, uh, uh, Chinatown. And, and Polanski was actually working with De Laurentiis on a remake of Hurricane, uh, which was an old thirties film directed by John Ford. 
And, um, but Polanski turned the movie down because he said, I don't know what to do with the monkey. And the famous approach that Dino made to Gillerman, Gillerman was working um, with De Laurentiis on a different project. And he called Gillerman and he said, he said he wanted to do King Kong is Polanski doesn't know, know what to do with the monkey. Do you know what to do with the monkey? And Gilliman's response is, yeah, I know what to do with the monkey. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's how he got the job. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, he, he brings a level of humanity to the proceedings. I mean, that's that's for sure. Uh, John Gilliman does. And uh, there's I, I think that's something that, um, uh, you know, it's probably heresy to say, but the original – uh, 1933 film and it is a classic and I, I do adore it and love it but uh, there is a certain coldness that runs through the original 1933 film that uh, this is a, a warmer more humanistic uh, film I think it has a lot, of, yeah. lot more humanity uh, to it that the 1933 film is lacking even though it is a masterpiece it, it is lacking that um, to a certain degree and I think he, he brings that to the plate but uh, but anyway we'll move along to the production um because I don't mm. want to hold you up all night long, and uh, while we're doing sure. this, sure. but uh, and we must uh, we must mention that uh, it was um, 88 years ago tonight, as we're recording this on March 2nd, that uh, the original 1933 film debuted. So it is that's right, at Radio City Music <laughs> Hall in New York City. City. Absolutely, yes. but uh, we, we picked a good day, uh, unknowingly. <laughs> 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 for me. Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, yes. Well, anyway, uh, so the production uh, they they were. Uh, having you know, they had gone to Hawaii by February. I know Carlo Rambaldi was coming up with the designs for this. Uh, the, originally, they wanted to use this 40 foot tall King Kong robotic King Kong that was right. run by hydraulics, and that turned out to be disastrous. And so they went with Rick Baker in a suit. So I'll get you to tell us a little bit about how all that happened. Yeah. Well, again, so so yeah, so you um, so they filmed in Hawaii, and then they came back and they filmed basically at the MGM Studios in Hollywood. And the whole the question, of course, was how they're going to make Kong appear on screen. Now, in the original film, it was stop motion animation and probably arguably to this day, still the best stop motion animation ever. Dino didn't want to do that for a number of reasons. First of all, he did not want to do something that could be directly compared to the original film. Um, so he didn't want to do it for that reason. The other reason was um, that. You know, what people don't remember now, we're all fans of these kinds of films. But by the 70s, although King Kong is a wonderful piece of stop motion animation, the technique had become sort of synonymous at that point with cheaper, lower budget films. And Dino didn't want to do that either. And so what they what they originally decided to do was use a man in an ape suit. But they wanted to create um, essentially the best ape suit that they could, not just a cheap knockoff suit. Um, but then at that, uh, but, and, and when Gilliman signed on, he said that was okay with him, but he wanted some full scale representation of Kong so that he could shoot scenes between the, the human characters and the ape without having to do, um, too many visual effects. So he wanted some kind of version of Kong. And the original film had created a full scale, uh, head and shoulders of Kong, a bust of Kong. So he wanted something like that. Um, and he also wanted a hand that would pick up um, Jessica Lang, And so they brought in uh, Carlo Rambaldi, who was a, an Italian visual effects expert. And Rambaldi's expertise was he was good at creating articulated puppets. And the idea originally was they were going to do this man in an ape suit, but then they were going to supplement it with this um, puppet version of Kong and then a puppet version of the hand. So Rambaldi got started on that. They had brought in Rick Baker through a bunch of circumstances. He was brought to the attention of the production and they were, he was told, you're going to create the Kong suit. So he began work on that. But meanwhile, Jaws had come out and Jaws had gotten all this publicity for their mechanical shark. And Dino, you know, who was a showman as well as a producer, he was really, he thought that publicity was great. And he basically asked Rambaldi, is there a way we can build a mechanical Kong in the same way that those guys built a mechanical shark? And Rambaldi, who was apparently a guy who would say yes to anything because he had great confidence in his abilities, said, yes, we can do a full-scale Kong that can do everything the script says it can do, which 
if you understand mechanics, you can't build a full scale thing that can walk around and smash buildings. But Rambaldi apparently was quite enthusiastic about doing this. And he designed this electronic, basically giant robot in, that could do all these things, he said. Meanwhile, and so then they said, well, we're going to use the robot to shoot all of these things. And we'll just use Rick Baker as a backup. And Baker was famous for saying, like, you guys, you can't you can't do what you're proposing. But they're like, no, 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 Rambaldi's a genius. We're going to get this done. And if you actually look at some of the storyboards for the film, they actually mark in the storyboards where they were going to use the robot. And they were going to use it in all sorts of scenes. But essentially, they went to um, – Rambaldi designed it. They went to an aircraft company to build it. And the aircraft company said, it's going to take two years to build it. It's going to cost like many, many millions of dollars. And goes, and well, that's only to get to the prototype. It'll take us even longer to work out all the bugs. So Dino thought, well, we can't do this. So he went to the film special effects director, um, the mechanical effects guy, a, a man named Glenn Robinson. And one of Robinson's side jobs is he would build rides for amusement parks, which are based on hydraulics. So he said to Glenn Robinson, can we build Kong ourselves? Can you do it with hydraulics? And can we do it like really quickly? Because we don't have two years to wait. So Robinson said, yes, I can do that. So that's where they ended up building the 40 foot Kong robot that appeared in the film. Rambaldi actually didn't have that much to do with it which is sort of the story of Rambaldi's involvement with the movie. Um, and, and it took them six or seven months to build the robot. And famously, as everyone knows, he only really worked in one scene and even then not particularly well. He only appears in six shots in the final movie. Um, and the irony to me is it was all based on the shark from Jaws and what they didn't seem to realize because the famous story is about the shark and Jaws is that didn't work either. So like, like it wasn't, it wasn't really like a surprise that this thing didn't work. So when they figured out that they weren't going to be able to really use this robot, then they went back to Rick Baker and they said, okay, you're going to be Kong through most of the movie. I'll try to make this quick. But so he and Rambaldi got into a competition. Dino wanted Ramb uh, Baker to work with Rambaldi. Baker didn't want to. He said, I'm, I, I'm going to do this. And and I think Dino wanted Rambaldi to save face after the debacle of designing this unworkable design. So Rambaldi ended up building a suit. Rick Baker ended up building a suit. Uh, in the end, of course, they chose Rick Baker's approach. But then Rambaldi was still kept involved and made a bunch of decisions that Baker didn't care for in the creation of the suit. But what they ended up collaborating fairly well on was the wonderful Kong masks which Baker created and sculpted, and Rambaldi used his mechanical puppet techniques to allow the faces to make all these wonderful expressions. So although the two of them fought all through the production, in the end, the one thing that they collaborated on that really came across wonderfully was were these wonderfully expressive masks. Um, so it ended up working out uh, fairly well. The other part that's uh, interesting in this is in the original conception um they wanted to make kong more like a prehistoric man like an australopithecus because since they were focusing so much on the relationship between kong and the girl which is not a thing that occurred in the original film they thought it might be weird to have a gorilla you know kind of lusting after this girl so they wanted to make this more like a caveman kind of kong like a prehistoric man kind of kong and when Baker saw the designs for that, he said, no, Kong's a gorilla. So he kind of ignored it and just built a gorilla suit. And Rambaldi built a, pr a primitive man suit. And when John Gilliman saw Baker's suit, he said, Kong has to be a gorilla. So we actually have Gilliman to thank for keeping Kong a gorilla. And then they went basically with that conception. Um, famously, the suit was uh, complicated and unwieldy. Rambaldi kept uh, inserting himself. Baker wanted to create a synthetic skin for the creature. Rambaldi had this idea to get a bear skin and use that as the basis for the costume. And uh, Baker objected because for all sorts of reasons, like mainly that the hair on the suit was designed to fit a bear. If you put it on a man, supposedly for an ape shape, the hair was going to stick up like a fur ball, which is what it did. So then they ended up shaving off all the hair so all that's left was a little fuzz underneath. And as Baker said, he goes, in the end, they wanted this bear suit 
and all we were left with was the fuzz on the bear suit. So Baker was very unhappy with the costume, but again, they were all very happy with the masks. And the other triumph of the film, uh, the big robot was a failure, but they built a pair of mechanical hands to pick up Jessica Lange and to caress her and to do all sorts of other things in the film. And um, those were built by Eddie Serkin, who was Glenn Robinson's assistant. And although the big robot didn't work very well, the hands work wonderfully in the movie. They're a terrific special effect. Oh, yes. Yes, they, they, re- they yeah. really do such a, a wonderful job in selling the illusion. And uh, I think there was an incident uh, when one of the hands malfunctioned and squeezed Jessica Lang, I, I believe, at one point during the production. I think I've read that someplace. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, well, there were a couple of... Um, they were hydraulically operated, so they didn't have a whole lot of finesse. Mm-hmm. So in the scene where he's caressing her with his finger, the finger hit her so hard at one point that she got a pinched nerve in her neck. Um, and then when they were testing the hand, uh, they used a stunt woman called Sunny Woods to uh, practice when the hand was picking up, um, you know, picking up and lowering uh, Jessica. And when they picked up Sunny Woods, the hydraulic uh, cable in the wrist snapped and the hand slammed down to the ground with Sonny Woods in it. And luckily, because she was a professional stunt person, she knew to relax her body. So she wasn't hurt. But they said if Jessica had been in the hand and didn't know to relax her body, she probably would have broken a lot of bones. Mm. Um, The other famous story is that when they were testing out the hand, uh, Eddie thought he would be funny and Dina was there. And so Eddie raised the middle finger of the Kong hand. Uh, and then it broke in that position. So um, <laughs> it would, for several days, Kong was giving everybody the finger until they got it fixed. <laughs> so. Oh, that's yeah. that's great. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I I know I've I've heard uh, Rick Baker. He was recently promoting his a book that he had put out a, uh, about a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. and he was talking about uh, shooting during the summertime. And I know a lot of yeah. it was in the middle of July, and he was talking about the just the, the tortures of wearing that suit uh, right in the dead heat of summer. And he was talking about right in the dead heat of summer and in front of blue screen, which in those days needed 12 arc lights to light it. Mm-hmm. And, and arc lights are incredibly hot. Baker lost like five pounds a day in water weight. Yeah. It's, it, it's pretty, pretty incredible. And I can, uh, mm. I, I, I heard, I think he said that he would drive straight home from the, I think they were shooting over at, um, in Culver City, I think. MGM. Yeah, MGM, yeah. yeah he would drive yeah. home to his apartment, which was across town, and he was talking about yeah. all the, the water that was in his <laughs> – the yeah. sweat, not the water, yeah, the sweat that shoes. was in his shoes. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a <laughs> funny story. Uh, yeah, pretty 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 torturous process, but uh, very realistic when they he, put it all together. Yeah, he also had to wear a set of contact lenses to make his eyes look more mm-hmm. ape-like. And that was in the days before sort of the flexible contact lenses. Yes. So they were they were basically hard lenses. And uh, Rick says to this day he has scars on the inside of his eyelids. Um, and he he also he got uh, terrible eye pain because when you wore those kind of contact lenses, uh, there was you couldn't get oxygen to the eye. So they eventually drilled a hole in it. But until then he had all this terrible eye pain. There was actually a second guy who appeared in the suit also a relief guy named bill shepherd will shepherd actually yes and uh and he loved the contact lenses because he said it made everything look like a trip like he was on a drug trip but baker did not care for them at all <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. that's uh it, it like i said he um he it, it, he it's amazing what uh, how the illusion that he put forth uh because yeah, you really absolutely. believe it you really or at least i did when i was when i saw it the first time i mean i was i was completely sold on it and i still think it holds up well, well after all these years yeah the film has you know it has um it, you know it, it it has its flaws and some of the effects are a little dodgy yes. but one of the things about the the other thing about the film that's important to remember is when when paramount was going to put out the movie um, so they were starting in January of 1976, and because they wanted to beat Universal, they had taken out an ad in the New York Times that basically, and it was in November of 75, and it said one year from today, uh, Paramount Pictures will release the new King Kong. That date was adjusted to Christmas rather than November, but essentially they started taking um, 
uh, deposits from theater owners to show the film at Christmas of 1976. So they couldn't delay the film. Um, so basically they had nine months from January or I guess 11 months from January to December to make a film that probably should have taken 18 months to two years to make. And, and what you see, and as I, I, as I said earlier, the film was shot roughly in sequence and the visual effects, um, if you look, uh, the, the, a lot of the, uh, the, the giant Kong stuff was done with Rick Baker against the blue screen and then put together with footage of Jessica Lang or Jeff Bridges. Um, and that was all done by a man uh, called Frank Vanderveer, who was one of Hollywood's uh, most legendary optical effects guys. Early on, if you look at the film, the optical effects are perfect. The, 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 the blue screen joined you you really believe that it's all happening in one shot that gets a little less believable as the film goes on basically because they didn't have the time to finesse the shots the way you need to do it's too complicated to go into here but there's a lot of finessing you have to do with the optical processes and they could do that in the early shots and they just ran out of time later on so the early visual effects are wonderful they get a little less wonderful as the film goes on. I still, my, my, my regret on the film is they didn't have like six more months. And the, the Kong stuff is similar. There are some shots that are just so wonderfully composed and photographed that the illusion is, is really wonderful and believable. Then there are some that are much less so. Again, all of this is really due to the time crunch because once, um, once the film you know, once they knew it was coming out in December, Paramount could not change that without having lots of legal problems because they had taken these advances. They actually had the exact same problem three years later with Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, they had taken all these advan advances and the movie wasn't ready, but it had to come out anyway. So I hopefully Paramount learned their lesson from those two films at some point. Um, but that ad that I mentioned that appeared in the New York Times I had an illustration by a famous science fiction illustrator named John Berkey. The original ending of the, of the Lorenzo Semple screenplay was the same as the first film. It was at the Empire State Building. And Berkey was hired to do an illustration. And he did like five or six illustrations of Kong in the Empire State Building. And Jeffrey Katzenberg, who later became the head of Paramount Production and later became the head of production at Disney and then one of the founders of DreamWorks, he was working in the publicity department. And he had suggested, why don't you do at least one illustration with Kong on top of the World Trade Center? Because the World Trade Center was brand new at that time. And they were trying to find ways to tell the audience, this is a brand new Kong. So they thought if we could put him on the World Trade Center, that would be, you know, more modern. So Berkey did one illustration of Kong on the World Trade Center, and they loved it. So that became the ad. And that's why the ending was then rewritten to put Kong on the World Trade Center as opposed to on the Empire State Building. And that led to them actually filming at the World Trade Center in July of 1976, right in the middle of the bicentennial celebration. Yes. And I think there was a, they, they put ads in the paper to get uh, the public to show up for the, yeah. uh, and they filmed for three nights, I believe it was, something like that. Filmed so three nights. The first night they had like 5,000 people show up, um, which was, sounds like a lot of people, but the World Trade Center Plaza was so big that that it didn't quite fill it up and so they were kind of worried they said gee i don't know what we're going to do the second night the second night 30,000 people showed up and there were so many people that the port authority of new york which is the entity that ran the world trade center they actually shut down the filming because they were worried that the weight of all those people on the plaza was going to collapse them. um and then so they had to come back for a third night with just a skeleton crew to film the rest of it um, but famously, the, the, on, that, on that main night, uh, the, Kong is laying in the plaza and they used a styrofoam version of a copy of the big robot Kong. And I actually think it's one of the most successful images of Kong in the film. But they had, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, sawhorses and things lined up to keep the crowd away. And the shot was supposed to be at a certain point they were going to lift up um, the, the barriers and all the people were supposed to surge forward to surround Kong and Jessica Lange. On the first cut, they, uh, I mean, on the first take, uh, they lifted the barriers, everyone surged forward, and a bunch of people ran past Jessica Lange. They climbed all over Kong, 
and basically tore him to pieces to try to get souvenirs. <laughs> so they stole his eye and they stole his finger and they stole his fur. <laughs> And the famous quote one of the producers said is, oh, my God, Kong got mugged. Uh, you know? um, so that was that was sort of, a, you know, Kong meets New York. 70s New York was not a hospitable place, you know. <laughs> so. This is this is true. This is true. It was not the high point of in the history of New York City, for sure. No, it was def- definitely not. <laughs> yeah, it was the following year when they had the blackout and the Son of Sam and all that. So, yeah, they were they were on a downward spiral at that point. Uh, and I grew up in New York during that era. It was uh, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> we actually got my dad to agree to take us to the filming of Kong. And uh, the night that we were going to go, he had to stay late at work. So oh. I was all ready to go. I was so excited. And then we never got there. Oh, so. wow. You could <laughs> I have actually been there. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. There, there's some amazing, uh, or there used to be, I don't know if it's still there or not, some uh, Super 8 home movie footage somebody shot Mm -hmm. on a super eight camera Mm -hmm. uh and they posted it on youtube for anybody who's interested uh that that there's just uh it's silent footage but it kind of gives you an idea of what was going on there so um yeah so anyway we will uh jump ahead real quick uh because i don't want to like i said i want to be respectful of your time but uh we will jump ahead to i think at the tail end of august uh this was the point where they just basically had to cease uh, production, uh, the, uh, because they were just running out of time. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I had heard that, uh, Gilliman basically started just tearing scenes out of the script at this point because they just weren't going to have time to film some things that they had originally wanted to include. But that may not be exactly accurate. I just wanted to see if you knew anything about that. Yeah, no, they, they didn't really take anything out. The script was pretty much shot. I, as I said, the place it got kind of compromised was more, the thing was rushed at that point. So the visual effects are a little less uh, sloppy. They actually finished filming at the end of August. That was uh, principal photography. Yes. And then they still did, they did visual effects and things basically right up until two weeks before the film was released. So the real crunch was in the, um, was in the, uh, the visual effects more than the shooting itself. Uh, it was a film that because they shot it in sequence, they were actually, this is very unusual, but they were editing the film as they went along. That wasn't so unusual, but they were literally fine cutting the first reels of the movie before they had even shot the last reels of the movie. And, um, one of the best parts of the film, is the wonderful score by John Barry. Um, and, and usually traditionally a composer waits until the film is at least in a rough cut in order to, be, to, to begin um, uh, composing because you want to get the rhythm of the film and the feel of the film. And you can't really do that before it's, you know, fairly well along in editing, but they just didn't have the time. So, so the film was scored in a really unusual way um barry started scoring it in like june and july he was scoring the first reels of the film and then he kind of did several different recording sessions all through until late in the fall um and and that's a really unusual way to do it and the thing that i find so impressive about that is he he was developing the the musical themes and the concepts kind of a little bit blind and yet it all really, I mean, it's really one of the great scores. Um, you know, Max Steiner's score for the original film is a landmark, but Barry's score for the 70s version is really wonderful. The fact that he was able to create such a coherent piece of work in such a piecemeal fashion just gives you even more um, more respect for the man's talent, you know? Um, and so the crunch really came right there towards the end, Richard Klein told me a a great story. There's a shot towards the end of the film where um, they, they have, um, you see the skyline of New York city. There's a, they, they, it's like a part of a matte, uh, matte painting. And they didn't have the shot in order to insert it into the special effects sequence. So they, um, they sent, they needed a shot of the Manhattan skyline. Richard was in the off production office at Culver city and Dino and Frank Vanderveer said, we need this shot of the skyline. And Richard said, I'll go get it for you tonight. He called New York, had a um, standby crew waiting for him. He got on a plane, flew five hours to New York, 
got off the plane, was picked up by this pickup crew. They drove to some place in New Jersey where they could get a great shot of the skyline. Richard took a still photograph, got back on the plane, flew five hours back. He was back in the office the next day, and the shot was dropped into the film like in, in, in two days' time. That's kind of how crazily crunched for time they were at that point. Oh, that's an amazing story. Yeah, that that really yeah. is. Oh, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And, and as you know, the, the film, while all this was going on, it was accompanied by one of the first of the giant marketing and merchandising campaigns. Mm-hmm. Like, if you were a young person when that movie came out, King Kong was everywhere by the time December 17th rolled around. So it was one of the big media events of its day, too, you know. Sure was. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's important to point out. So, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about the post-production real, real quickly. Uh, I know Ralph mm-hmm. Winters was the editor on this film. Uh, yep. I, I know that there's, and we'll talk about this briefly uh, after we finish with the post-production. I know there was some stuff that was sure. uh, excised. Probably for uh, yeah. the runtime, they wanted to keep that close to two hours, and it, it clocked in at two fourteen, I believe. Uh, That's right. So yeah. you can mm-hmm. you can tell us a little bit about uh, the challenges, maybe that Ralph Winters had with the uh, piecing together of uh, all the stuff yeah. that he had to work with. Right. Well, the the big problem was, and this is you know, Kong was one of the last big visual effects films before Star Wars, and Star Wars created a whole new way of approaching visual effects. Kong was produced in in the old day style, which meant that they didn't really have like an effects supervisor in the way that they came to in the, in the post Star Wars era. So basically, Ralph was in charge of making sure all the visual effects shots were put together, and he said that was one of his biggest challenges. The other challenge was obviously runtime. So they 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 didn't drop too many things, but there were a couple of odds and ends they dropped. The, probably the most, um, the, the scene that fans love the most is there was a, a scene where when Kong is rampaging through New York, he picks up a car and throws it through a building and the building explodes and Kong is, is caught in the flames. And there's a famous picture, one of the early publicity stills of Kong standing in front of the burning building. And that was one of the first images when Time Magazine promoted the film. And it was never in the movie, but, but it, it was in the original rough cut version. Um, so that was one of the major scenes that came out. The other major change was originally the character of um, Charles Grodin played a character, Fred Wilson, who's the villain of the piece. And the original way that it was scripted is Wilson brings Kong to New York and he's thinking he's the oil company executive and he thinks it's going to make his career because it's going to be this big promotional success. And then, of course, Kong escapes and goes crazy and and destroys things. And the president of the company fires Wilson. He says, you know, you, you ruined our company, so you're fired. So Wilson's trying to get out of the chaos, and suddenly he finds himself face-to-face with Kong, who lifts up his foot and slams it down, and you think he's killed. But then when Kong lifts his foot, you see that Groden has survived, and like basically the idea being that he kind of wished Kong had killed him because his life has been ruined. Yes. So it's kind of like an ironic, sarcastic end for the character. But Groden did such a good job of making Fred a villain that in, that they had a preview and audiences hated the fact that Wilson survived. So the other big edit Ralph made was to have Kong stamped down and then by doing a little editorial trickery, you're just left with the idea that, nope, Wilson got squashed and people were much more satisfied with that ending, I think. <laughs> um, so, that you know, that, that was the other uh, challenge that uh, Winters had uh, was that in the long shots, like um, when Kong, like there's a scene where Kong comes up out of the water, he crosses uh, the East River in Manhattan. And basically when the Kong suit got wet, it basically looked like a man in a really wet, uh, hairy bathing suit. So he had to do a lot of cutting to get rid of Kong's legs in a lot of scenes because he said otherwise, he goes, it just ruined the illusion. So if you actually look at the scene where Kong comes out of the water, you never see his legs. <laughs> so that was a big thing Ralph Winter had to handle, you know. Yeah, I, I can imagine so. And uh, mm-hmm. I know there's more footage of that also in the television version uh, when he yeah. comes out of the, and, uh, the water. Yeah, and you will see that, I believe, on the, on the new disc. Um, and the television version, 
that was basically the original rough cut of the film, which is what a lot of those TV versions in those days were. They needed to pad it out so they could show it on two nights on NBC. So when you, I mean, I'm actually really thrilled it's going to be on the new Blu-ray because archivally it's terrific. You get to see a lot of the extra footage and stuff. But from a narrative point of view, the theatrical cut is very well paced. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is full of a lot of, the pacing isn't really great because it's a rough cut. So there's a lot of extraneous footage in it. But you do get to see the scene where he picks up the car and throws it through the building. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Now, some of this extra footage has turned up in the uh, Region 2 Blu-ray uh, before. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were about 15 minutes worth of deleted scenes that were actually in their proper aspect ratio of 2.35 to 1 because the film was shot in Panavision. And so that yeah. that has turned up. So there were some of those scenes before, but the, the TV cut runs three hours and two minutes as opposed to the two hours and 14 minutes. Uh, I, yeah. I do know the one complaint about the TV cut is that some of the, there are some scenes where you can tell they're really padding it out by repeating. Uh, I think the yeah. part where King Kong is, uh, where he's beating down the wall on Skull Island to get to, uh, yeah. to, to Dwan. They just, he keeps, he beats that wall for an eternity to get through. <laughs> he pounds it, pounds it, pounds it. He just, Yep, he keeps pounding and pounding and pounding. The other part that is interminable is when the ship is trying to leave um, leave port. They actually repeat a bunch of shots yes. just to sort of drag it out. Because one of the cut scenes, Jeff Bridges, the star of the film, is introduced in the theatrical version when he pulls up to the dock of the ship. He plays a guy who stows away on the boat, and he dresses in the outfit of one of the sailors. And he pulls up and he bribes his way to get into the, into the, onto the dock. Um, but originally the character was introduced in a bar and, and basically they tell you how he got the, the, the sailor outfit that he, that he got. He knocks out this, um, sailor from the ship and, and steals, basically steals his, his outfit. It, it was not a necessary scene and it's not a good scene, but in order to put it back into the film, they kept basically having to repeat the footage of the ship getting ready to leave. So you're watching it and you're saying like, this ship is taking an hour of the movie to get out of the court, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. And the other place, there's a scene where, um, uh, they, uh, to capture Kong, Fred Wilson calls, uh, for an airdrop of chloroform. And in the movie, you see a plane flying overhead that drops these barrels out with parachutes. And that's the chloroform that they used to capture Kong. But in the TV version, that plane circles about 20 times and it just goes on and on and on. And you're like, ah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, this this is true. This is true. They they, they would do that to, uh, like you said, to extend it to, to where they could get extra advertising yeah. dollars in there. Uh, and Absolutely. Yeah. So I know that uh, – that the film was reissued again. It came out obviously uh, December 1976, and then was reissued again mm -hmm. uh, over sometime later in 1977, I think, because I remember it came back to our town, the town I grew up in, uh, to our drive-in. I I saw it in a in a walk-in theater uh, about a month after it came out, maybe a month and a half mm -hmm. is when I saw it. I was six years old at the time, obviously made a big ah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, made yeah. a big, big impression on me. And I, I had been following the uh the big uh, publicity that was leading up to the film and you know, they did such a good job selling uh promoting the film with that forty foot uh mechanical Kong, they actually yeah. had people <laughs> like when if you were a very gullible child like myself yeah. at the age of uh, six, which you know, I, I didn't have a lot of life experience behind me, let's just say yeah. that. And I actually believe that uh there was an actual forty foot King Kong that was uh -huh. lurking about somewhere uh that had been yeah. used in the film. So, uh, yeah. no, that to this day, you will have people get really uh, in a snit about it. They'll be like, you know, they, they, they lied to us. They told it was a robot. Like, I guess I'm always very sanguine about that. I'm like, you know what? It's Ballyhoo. It's publicity. And if you read the paperback making up, excuse me, or if you watch like Red Time magazine, the promotion, yes. they all said there was a guy in an ape suit. Mm -hmm. Like, so I guess I never quite got the 
the the uproar about it. But yeah, there, there's there's no giant ape, there's no giant <laughs> robot in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, well, the funny thing is, it, it actually wasn't re-released. I think what you did is you saw it on the tail end of its run, because one of the weird things about Kong back then, what would happen is a film would be released, and then it would play out, and in those days, it could take six months to almost a year to yes. play out all around the world. That is true. And then they would usually re-release it like um, 18 months later was sort of the pattern. Mm -hmm. And then after the second re-release, it would go to television. Mm -hmm. um, th that was the pattern in those days. But NDC had actually paid Dino $20 million um, before the release of the film for the TV rights. So it actually was only released once. I think you saw it that when it came back to your town, that was the tail end of its run because it did play about a year, but it went on television um, in the fall of 78, which was only about two years after the original release, a little less than two years. It didn't have time to get re-released. It's actually one of the things that I think got in the way of the film being a little better known now than it is because it didn't get a re-release. And NBC had the rights tied up to it for five years. They showed it in 1978, and then they didn't show it again till 1983. They showed it when Jessica Lange got nominated for an Oscar for Tootsie and for Francis. She had the double nomination that year. And um, so basically it was in limbo for almost five years. So no one saw it. And so it never quite had the afterlife that a film of that time would normally have had. And, and I don't know what the other situation is, but in those days, after a network showing, it would go to local stations. And it never, it, it did go to some local stations, but never the way that like a lot of the other films did. And part of that is because D, the way Dino financed the movie, Paramount had the rights in the United States and Canada, but the rights were kind of divided up in all the other territories of the world. So part of the problem was no one person control over it and it just kind of went away which i always feel is sort of a shame for it because i really do it didn't play in a lot of revival theaters like the way a lot of other films did yes so it kind of fell out of the public consciousness for a long time you know um and and that's why i'm kind of thrilled that this blu-ray is coming out i mean i'm thrilled they asked me to participate and i was of course thrilled and pleased to do so but even if I hadn't participated, I'm just glad it's coming out in a much in a good edition because it, it came out on VHS, it came out on Laserdisc, it came out on VHS, um, and, and they did come out in a very uh, bare bones DVD uh, production about you know, 22, 23 years ago. But it just never got promoted. Now they're going to do, you know, they're going to fill it with extras and everything. I feel like the film's finally getting its due, you know. Yes, yes. On it, it took them only forty-five years for it to get its dues. Right. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Better late than never. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, absolutely. Yeah. It's. Uh, yeah, I do remember, and I have seen this. There, there was some sort of a double feature that it played with Orca the Killer Whale at some point. Interesting. Because I okay. have seen an ad for that somewhere. Uh, so that, mm. and but that might have been something that was cooked up by a local theater or something it might not have been a national uh thing but then i again, think so i saw that yeah. and i thought well that totally makes sense because both of those are dino uh films so both dino both paramount yeah, so that may make sense yeah. so yeah, yeah i have seen there there is a double bill uh out there somewhere you can probably google it and find the image so i, I don't know what the story is behind that but to, but anyway uh ne neither here nor there but, uh, yeah, I would be curious to hear about your first experience with it before we uh, wrap up here uh, and when, sure. where you saw it the first time. I, I saw it. Uh, I was born in, in the Charlotte, North Carolina area and uh, in a small town about an hour away from Charlotte called Lincolnton, North Carolina. And we had a walk-in theater called the Century Theater was the name of the theater. And uh, okay. I saw it in um, – uh, early February of 1977 is when I saw it, and like I said, it made a lasting impact on me. And uh, and so I, I'll be curious to hear your story yeah. about where you saw it. Well, I was I was obviously I was a giant fan of the original Kong, and it was my favorite film, and probably still is my favorite film. So when they and I was living when they announced the production, my family was living in New York. We were living in Long Island, which is right outside New York City. 
And that's the whole where we were going to go see the filming and then we couldn't go. Um, but I followed the reason I'm, I really have a soft spot for this film in part because I think it's a good film. Um, you know, I, I think it's worthy of attention and I do feel it's gotten kind of a negative reputation that I think is really unfair. Mm -hmm. I, I like the film very much, but also it was my first really significant movie experience. I saw that ad in the New York Times in November of 75 and I, that's the first I'd heard of it. And, and you could send away, it was a black and white ad, but you could send away and get a color reprint of the poster. So I, I cut it out and I sent in my two, $2 or whatever it was. And I got the poster. It's actually sitting right here as I'm talking to you frames now. Um, <laughs> and, and then I just followed the production. I looked at every bit of information that came out. If you ordered that poster, they sent you a King Kong newsletter. There were four issues where they talked about, oh, we're filming in Hawaii and all this. So I was really following this thing. And in the summer of 76, right after they filmed, um, they filmed the New York stuff, my family moved from Long Island to, Stan um, well, we moved to Connecticut, uh, to, to Fairfield County in Connecticut, which is the part of Connecticut that's right next to New York. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's a suburb of New York also. And so I was living in Connecticut, and I have this great story, which I want to pay tribute to a man whose name I never met, but my dad had an office down the street from a theater called the Ridgeway Theater in Stamford, Connecticut. And the Ridgeway Theater was the, the place you saw every big movie back then. It was a giant, it was one of the 50s shopping center movie theaters. It was just a giant screen and a wonderful presentation. And I remember one day in the fall, I went, I was visiting my dad in his office and I went up to like go to the store to get a snack or something. And I walked past the theater and they had the giant standee of the John Berkey poster in the lobby and, and suburban theaters in Connecticut, they didn't have matinees. So the, they would only have evening shows um, during the week. So the theater wasn't open. So I was just staring at this thing because I was like totally entranced with it. <laughs> and the guy who was the manager of the theater must have seen me and he came and he unlocked the door and he said, you want to look at it? And I said, I definitely want to look at it. And I came in and he let me, he let me take a look at this standee, which, you know, I was entranced with it. And he told me all about when it was coming and everything. Um, and even told me I could have the standee, except then I never ended up getting it. But, but he was really kind and he just knew I was a little movie geek. So on December 17th, 1976, um, I got out of school and I bugged my mom and she dropped my sister and I off. And in those days before, you know, ticketing and online and everything, you want to see a movie, you better get there early. Um, the first show was eight o'clock. I made my mom drop me off at four o'clock. <laughs> so <laughs> my sister and I were the first people in line. <laughs> and, um, and then, uh, you know, by the time the show came around, uh, you know, the, the line was basically around the block, but we were first in line and uh, an older couple came by and they said, what are you waiting in line for? We said, we see King Kong. And they said, we, we saw King Kong on our first date, the original. So we got to talk to them and then they opened the door, they went in and, uh, I got to watch the film and the Ridgeway theater did this really strange thing. The guy who was the projectionist in those days, you know, you did it reel by reel. Mm -hmm. He put the wrong reel on. Oh. So right as Kong was going to show up, it suddenly cut to later in the film and you heard Kong roaring on the soundtrack and everyone in the theater yelled, turn it off, because nobody wanted to see Kong before his entrance in the film. Oh, yeah. So they had to turn it off. <laughs> yeah. And then it took them 10 minutes to rethread everything and then they played the movie all the way through. But um, yeah, so I went with my sister Nancy and uh, we we enjoyed the film thoroughly and I saw it a couple more times and then it went away. So I, I didn't see it for many years after that, you know? Oh, that's a great story. Yeah. That, that's mm. really, that's really good. Yeah. I, I was a projectionist at one point, so I can, I can relate to that for, <laughs> for certain. Yeah. yeah. Those things do, can and do happen. Um, sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I know the recep reception on it critically was a little mixed. I know Pauline Kael was a fan of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, some mm -hmm. of the other critics, I know Richard Schickel, uh, Time Magazine. I think he's the one that reviewed it for Time Magazine. I, th I think he uh, he did. Yeah, yeah he, he, did. he gave it a, a glowing review. Uh, but you know, a lot of people were kind of ho hum on it, and uh, um, 
you know, and I and I did think that was sad that critically it didn't quite get the love. And I think there were just people were just uh, unfavorably. Uh, I guess they wanted it to be the original film, and it's a totally different mm-hmm. entity. And I think that's part of what what happened. And you know, there was a lot of criticism lobbed at. Lorenzo Simple's uh, dialogue in the film uh, for being corny and cliched, but you know there are a lot of very poignant lines that people tend to overlook in the film. Uh, Absolutely. You know, for instance, the uh, the line where he uh, when Jeff Bridges says something to the effect of, um, you know, when they take uh, Kong off the island, they'll just be a bunch of burned out drunks. You you took away the yeah. mystery and the terror in their lives. I, I think that's yeah. profound, and uh, and there are other I, ones it, I could cite. The, the two best that, that you, the line you, you're quoting is, is one of my favorites. And the, the tag of that is he says, when we took Kong, we kidnapped their God. And I thought that was a wonderful way of, of contextualizing it. There's also a wonderful moment in the beginning of the film where Jeff Bridges is talking about the legend of Kong. And um, if you remember, the original Kong begins with a quote that's supposedly an old Arabian proverb, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, fa- uh, you know, fake bit of hokum, uh, you know, low beauty looked upon the beast and stayed its hand from killing. Um, and Jeff Bridges has this line where he repeats an incantation that was written on a um, on the thwart of a boat, where he says, from thy wedding with the creature who touches heaven, lady God preserve thee. And I think that's just as good a line as the old Arabian proverb. It it really sends chills up your back. Um, Lorenzo's idea, what what they were worried about was, but at that time Kong was a, the original was 43 years in the past, and they were worried that it would be considered uh, that some people might laugh at the idea because you know the idea being well the modern audience was more sophisticated. I think that might be a little. You could argue that point, but that was the idea. So he put the the humorous lines in because he said, because we didn't want the audience to laugh at the movie. So we thought if we could get them to laugh with the movie, that that would take any edge off if someone was going to not take the movie seriously. And so there's a couple of jokey lines in there that, you know, maybe maybe we would cut if we were like redoing it. But I, that was the idea. Uh, but the film is never disrespectful of Kong. It, it is often called campy. And I, I don't think it's campy. I do think it has some lines that wink at the audience. Um, and I, if for, and whether you agree with Lorenzo's logic or not, that's why they're in there. But the film takes the legend seriously. And I think that's part of the reason I think it's a much better film than its reputation. Um, you know, the a reputation among some people uh, would have you believe. I also think, you know, Gillerman was, you know, maybe not a high art director like some, you know, like Polanski at that time was, you know, considered sort of an auteur director. Gillerman was never that. But he has a lot. There was all these wonderful poetic touches in the film. Um, one of the ones that I can think of is after Kong is kidnapped, uh, he, he's dropped into this pit and it's all full of chloroform and he passes out. And there's just this wonderful image of his hand sort of reaching up like impotently because he's, he's basically being overcome by the chloroform yes. and it drags like smoke behind it, the, the chloroform, like he just, he's powerless. It's a wonderful image and it, and it really evokes sort of the mystery of the story and the other part that I I actually think it's the best image of Kong ever. The the penultimate shot of the film is Jessica Lange standing in front of the dead Kong, and the camera sort of pulls up and away, and you see her, and you see Kong's dead body, you see the crowd surrounding them. And when I see that shot, what I think to myself is that is the best representation of the legend of King Kong that you could ever ask for. And I don't think there's an image in the original film or in the Peter Jackson remake that, that is as powerful as that for summing up like the, the, the power of the story basically. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think those who dismiss it, I would encourage them to take a second look because there's a number of those things in the film. Um, it has its goofy parts, but it, it gets the legend right. And it also does a thing, it actually puts the beauty and the beast story into Kong. Most people who don't think about it don't realize in the original Kong, there is no emotional connection 
between Fay Ray and Kong. That's correct. It's a monster movie. Mm-hmm. And he scares her and she's frightened of him from beginning to end. He falls in love with her, but she is never for a moment, you know, has any connection with him other than to be terrified. Lorenzo Semple worked in, they create a relationship. So by the end of the movie, Dwan is devastated by Kong's death. That's, and it, it makes the ending of that version much more emotional than the, than the ending of the original. And it's a, it's a, it's a concept that Peter Jackson poured it over almost entirely into his version, um, which is fine. The only issue I have with that is he spent the making of his version putting down the seventies version. And I thought, well, you, you took the main part of it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I, I think was good that he did. Um, but that's, you know, like that's when people think of the Kong story, they think of the connection between Kong and the girl. And that's in the 70s movie. That's not in the 30s film. And that I think you have to tip your hat to that in that film as well. In that film as well. In that film as well. In that film as well.